At about the same time that Galileo was doing his work on motion, uh, Johannes Kepler developed his laws of planetary motion. And this is interesting because this is sort of uh, explaining the way that planets move mathematically, but not explaining why they moved the way that they did. Kepler's laws were very, very important because they were used by Newton as part of his development with the universal law of gravitation. Kepler did a description of planetary motion, but he really didn't know why the planets would move the way that they did. It was really Galileo, I'm sorry, it was really Newton who uh, put all the mathematics together and said, well, you know, just as we know a, a force will uh, influence motion, uh, the universal law of gravitation, which describes the force between uh, two objects with mass, was able to explain the description that uh, Kepler came up with for planetary motion. So um, interestingly, Kepler uh, was born in uh, what is today present day Germany. Uh, at the time, it was essentially the Holy Roman Empire. And this was a conglomerate of many Germanic states. It had really nothing to do with the, the original uh, Roman Empire. And uh, Kepler first became interested in uh, planetary motion when he uh, studied the Copernican model, the heliocentric model uh, at university. Very gifted student. Uh, like many of the astronomers of this time, he was deeply religious as Galileo was. And um, not only did he do uh, important work in astronomy, he also made important uh, discoveries in, in optics and mathematics. But of course, he's best known for his laws of planetary motion. So we're going to take a look at these laws and see um, why the uh, three laws of motion um, are what they are. Now, first of all, Johannes Kepler had been working on uh, models of the solar system. <laughs> and he you know, initially thought that there was some connection between music and mathematics um, uh, to the, the, the planets and the way that they moved. However, this uh, uh, geometrical connection that, that Kepler was first exploring uh, was soon found out to be nothing more than a coincidence. Now, Kepler was um, sort of fortunate and unfortunate that another you know, huge astronomer of the time, much bigger than, than Kepler, uh, Tycho Brahe, had just fallen out of favor with the King of Denmark, King Christian of Denmark, and had uh, either moved or fled uh, to the Holy Roman Empire, Empire to work under uh, Emperor uh, Rudolph of the time. Now, the emperor was, was a, a savvy individual, and uh, he knew that uh, Tycho was a difficult person to work with, and certainly his former employer, uh, you know, had uh, had uh, problems with him. So Rudolf wanted to make sure that, well, if, if Tico suddenly has problems here, I want to make sure that all the money that I'm spending on him, um, I'm going to get something out of it. He's just not going to, you know, go flee to some other place, you know, some other country. And, uh, you know, Tico is the most famous astronomer of the time. And, uh, you know, certainly any country would be more than happy to have them as, as a court astronomer. But Rudolph didn't want to spend all this money on this guy just to have this guy take his his game someplace else. So uh, Rudolph did something that was very interesting. He, he took the younger Kepler, uh, who was, you know, you know, pretty respected in his own right and made him Tico's assistant. Basically, I wouldn't call it a spy, but basically... Kepler was the insurance policy. Now, why was Tycho so important? Well, Tycho was one of the greatest observational astronomers, certainly of his time. And he had charted out the movement of, of the planets. He had charted out the movement of, of, of comets. He made um, measurements at, at high, higher precisions than, than had ever been seen. And um, Tycho didn't like the fact that he was being shadowed by Kepler but it was really part of his, his employment. So what, um, what uh, Tycho did is he tried to throw Kepler uh, a curveball 
and more or less just try to get him get him out of his uh, get him out of his way. Uh, Tico had, had a lot of trouble with his data on Mars. The data on Mars just didn't seem to work mathematically, seemed to contradict itself, because at the time, everybody believed that the heavenly bodies would move in circles. The idea of a perfect circle um, and the heavens was a very, very central idea, and nobody could imagine that the planets would move any way differently. But Again, Tycho had a very difficult time, um, you know, getting this data to, to make any sense. So he figured, well, you know, if I'm having trouble with this data, I'm going to give it to Kepler and that's going to keep Kepler busy. That's going to keep Kepler out of my hair. And to a great extent, this battle with Mars that Kepler had um, did occupy him for quite some time. But it's this is where uh, Kepler had the re revelation that these orbits are not circular. Okay, Galileo believed the planets went around the sun in circular orbits. Um, everybody else believed that circular motion was the basis of celestial, you know, celestial mechanics. So soon after um, Kepler figures out this data, uh, Tycho actually passes away. So, you know, kind of ironic that that Rudolf, um, you know, was shown to have made the correct move, but not necessarily for the the reasons that he he did this, and um, you know the what uh, Kepler realized is that uh, these planets were going around the sun in, in elliptical orbits, and Mars's orbit's not all that elliptical. Here I've, I've plotted a, a, a perfect blue circle. I plotted the uh, the orbit of Mars as it would be compared to a perfect circle, and you can see there's not a huge difference there. So, you know, we can forgive Tycho for, for you know, not realizing that uh, the circle was not the correct fit for this because it's, it's very close. It almost gets there, but it's not quite. And, of course, this uh, orbit for, for Mars, this data that Tycho had taken, Kepler showed that the planets went around the sun in ellipses. And, again, circles are subset of ellipses. So the fact that you know, these planetary orbits are, are so close to being a circle, but but not quite, is not exactly surprising. So Kepler's first law was very, very basic. All planets go around the sun in elliptical orbits. The sun sits at one of the foci of the ellipse. Foci is plural for focus. Um, the second focus is unoccupied. And this right here is a, a great, great exaggeration. Again, most planets, the, the, the most uh, elliptical of all orbits for the planets is, is probably Mercury. And that's not all that more elliptical or what we say eccentric than Mars's orbit right there. But if we exaggerate it, um, planets go around the sun with these elliptical orbits. We now know that asteroids and comets also have these elliptical orbits where, again, the sun sits at one of the, the, the foci. Um, that's also true with the moon. The moon goes around the Earth in elliptical orbits. But again, Kepler was sticking to the planets. Um, so uh, all planets move in elliptical orbits. Um, as the planet gets closer to the sun, obviously the force becomes larger. The um, uh, potential energy becomes more negative. So it gets more kinetic energy. It speeds up. And then as it goes around, it gets slower. By the way, if we look at an ellipse, the closest distance between the sun and a planet is called the uh, perihelion. Peri for, for basically talking about the, the closest point. Helion saying that it's orbiting the sun. Something orbits the Earth. It's uh, perigee and apogee. And, um, you know, depending on uh, the different planets. For instance, Jupiter, it'd be perijove or an apijove. Hopefully I got this correct. So looking at an ellipse, again, um, if we break down an ellipse, A represents the semi-major axis. The major axis goes uh, all the way from here to here, but this is the semi, it's half that uh, major axis, so A is the semi-major axis. B is a semi-minor axis. C represents the distance from the center of the ellipse 
to the focus. Okay, so if we want to use a, an equation to describe an ellipse, we can use this equation right here, where we have x squared divided by a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to one. That is the equation for ellipse in Cartesian coordinates. Okay, and again, a is a semi-major axis, b is a, a semi-minor axis. The foci are located at positive C and negative C. So for instance, I would have a focus right here. The other focus is right here. So positive C, negative C, where C is equal to plus or minus the square root of A squared minus B squared. So if A were equal to B here, okay, C would have to be zero because we would have C is equal to the square root of A squared minus A squared, that's zero. Okay, so for a perfect circle, we only have um, one focus, the very center. But as A and B become more different, okay, C, the distance between the center of the ellipse and the, um, and the, the focus becomes greater and greater. Eccentricity, I've been throwing that word around a lot. Eccentricity is just the ratio of how large the semi-major axis is, I'm sorry, the, how large the distance to the focus is from the center to and the, and the semi-major axis, okay? So uh, again, for a circle, C would be zero. So the eccentricity of a circle is zero. As C becomes larger and larger, okay, as the ellipse, you know, stretches out, okay, E becomes larger and larger also, okay? We say that a parabola has an eccentricity of one. If we were to stretch this ellipse out infinitely long, okay, in this particular case, the distance C would be actually going to infinity. The distance A would be going into infinity. And essentially, the eccentricity would be infinity over infinity would be one. It gets a little bit more difficult to, to use that that logic with um, hyperbola because their E is greater than, than, than uh, one, but there are other ways of defining E here. So again, looking at different ellipses, if we have a circle, E is gonna be equal to zero. Uh, here's what an ellipse with an eccentricity of 0.3 is. And again, that means the distance to the focus in the center uh, is 0.3 times the distance of the semi-major axis. Here's an ellipse of 0.9. So this would be sort of similar to the type of orbit we might see a periodic comet like Halley's Comet on, you know, very eccentric orbit going out all the way to the orbit of, of, of Saturn. And then again, if something is not bound to an orbit, it'll trace out a parabola, eccentricity of one, or hyperbola, eccentricity greater than one. And again, here's just a, a simple calculation here, uh, just in arbitrary units, maybe these can be astronomical units. So let's say C is equal to eight here, A is uh, 10. So C divided by A is equal to eight over 10. So the ellipse that's shown here has an eccentricity of, of 0.8, all right? At closest approach, the um, distance would be two, okay? Um, this would be perihelion, would be uh, you know perhaps two astronomical units. Um, again, these are just arbitrary units. The aphelion would be 18 astronomical units. So clearly you can see um, it gets nine times closer to perihelion than aphelion. So um, it's gonna experience a, a much greater illumination uh, closer to the sun as many comets do. Uh, as you approach perihelion, if they're periodic, they'll form their tail. As you get far away from the sun, they'll slow down and uh, refreeze. And Halley's Comet comes by every 70-some years, spends most of its time out by the orbit of Saturn, and then quickly, as it approaches the sun, they'll quickly form a tail, but not spend very much time near perihelion. That's where Kepler's second law comes into play. And again, 
it's fairly obvious what's going to happen here. As a planet gets close to the sun, its potential energy becomes more negative. So its kinetic energy is going to go up. So it's going to go faster around the sun here. And as it goes further away, the potential energy is becoming less negative. So the kinetic energy is going to be uh, used up as a result. But Kepler's second law is more precise than just we get faster, closer to the sun, we get slower, further from the sun. It states that if I draw a line between the sun and a planet, that line will sweep out equal amounts of area over equal amounts of time. So if a planet moved from here to here during one month, it'll move from here to here during another month, it'll move from here to here during another month, this area will be the same as this area. Always sweeps out the same amount of area. Again, I'm not sure how he came up with this, but this is very, very important because this is related to the conservation of not only energy, but also the conservation of angular momentum. Okay, again, closer to the sun, higher speed, you sweep out the same amount of area than as you were further from the sun. And clearly this must be a consequence of conservation of energy. How is it related to uh, conservation of angular momentum, however. Let's go into the math a little bit to try to understand this. And again, you know, higher kinetic energy, low potential energy here, high potential energy here, low kinetic energy here. Okay. Now, if we define our angular momentum as L is equal to R cross P, R is our position vector with respect to the sun, P is the momentum, we know that P is M times V. The mass isn't going to change of the planet. So the only thing that can change to change the momentum is, of course, the velocity. So by conservation of angular momentum, my L should be the same here as it is here. Okay. What that implies is that if the mass is constant, right? Okay. L here is equal to L here. L1 equals L2. We can cancel out the masses on both sides. We're left with R1 times P1. R1 times P1 is equal to R2 times P2. Okay. And again, if the mass is constant, this now we divide both sides by M, we get R1V1 is equal to R2V2. So when R1 has a, has a small value, you're near perihelion, your P1 is going to be maximum. When R2 becomes a large value, uh, V2 is going to become small. And again, that's just conservation of angular momentum. L is R cross P at perihelion and aphelion. L becomes R times MV. The M's cancel on both sides. So R1 times V1 is equal to R2 times V2. And again, we can uh, see this uh, once more. Let's divine, define a small little infinitesimal curve along this path as ds. ds is r times d theta, okay? So d theta is just this little angle right here. So r d theta is going to be the path length that it travels, ds. And we know that if ds is equal to r d theta, the angle that is swept in this little wedge is going to be one half the base times the height. This is essentially a triangle, right? Uh, <clears throat> the base here is R d theta. The height is R. So one half R ds. ds again is R d theta becomes one half R squared d theta. Okay. So how do we show that dA is going to be constant over constant amounts of time? Well. By Kepler's second law, dA dt, the area that's swept out, has to be some constant, okay? If I take the time derivative on the other side, okay, I get that one half, we're going to take a small enough time step that r is constant here, one half r squared d theta dt, we recognize this as omega, okay? So dA dt is equal to one half r squared omega and again, if we're, you know, taking another definition of angular momentum, the um, magnitude of the angular momentum is I times omega. 
The moment of inertia for a mass around some central point is m r squared. Okay, so again, um, multiplying both sides by m, so we're going to multiply this side by m, this side by m. Multiplying both sides by m, I get m d a d t is equal to one half m r squared omega, which is equal to one half l. L is an angular momentum. If the angular momentum is constant, dA dt must also be constant. So that's just a, 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 a you know, a, a more uh, in-depth proof showing the same thing. Kepler's third law is related to something that we looked at earlier when we showed that the period squared of the orbit was proportional to the radius of the orbit cubed. This is for circular orbits, but of course, this also holds for elliptical orbits too. So again, um, the time it takes to go around the sun squared is proportional to the radius of the orbit, or more precisely, the semi-major axis. So t squared is proportional to some constant times r cubed, where k is a constant related to whatever bodies being orbited. And again, uh, we can show that this does work by going back to uh, what we started out when we we're finding the periods of, 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 of orbits. Uh, for a circular orbit, the centripetal force is equal to the gravitational force, mv squared over r equals g m, uh, big M over r squared. Okay. And again, making that substitution for velocity, because so I want period to be in here. We got this equation right here, which simplifies to this equation, okay? And clearly, um, the period squared by this equation, balancing centripetal force and balancing the uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation, the period squared is proportional to the radius cubed, where K is some constant based on what is being orbited, which only depends on the mass of the body being orbited. So uh, for everything orbiting the sun, there's some value of K that's going to be different for everything that's orbiting the earth, which is going to have a slightly larger value because its mass is smaller. But again, if I plot the period squared as a function of the radius cubed, okay, here's my experimental evidence. Here's a semi-major axis, okay? Here's the, uh, the, the period. And uh, these are both on logarithmic, uh, on, on logarithmic scales right here. So when I um, plot them right here, I get a straight line. Okay. You can also do this. Probably it, it'd be more helpful to plot the semi-major axis cubed on a linear scale as a function of the period squared. You would get a straight line there too, showing that the two are proportional to one another. And again, those are Kepler's uh, three laws. Um, basically, they were uh, in, important because um, you know they involve conservation of energy, they involve conservation of um, angular momentum, but they only work when the force is due to an inverse square law. Um, by the way, satellites will actually change their orbits. Um, Whenever they, they, they want to, uh, well, this is fairly ob obvious. Uh, let's say you want to go from a low Earth orbit to a geostationary orbit. Um, usually when, for instance, we want to put up a new uh, weather satellite, I think we just put up a new GOES, by the way. Uh, GOES U, which is going to be uh, probably the replacement of GOES East or GOES West. Um, they give them letters first before they, they assign them to the East Coast or they assign them to the West Coast. And usually the older, what was the older East satellite or West satellite um, is just put into sort of a parking orbit as a backup in case any of the satellites fail. But again, the first thing when a satellite is launched, it, it first takes a um, low Earth orbit. And then it fires its rockets and um, it will change its circular orbit to a more elliptical orbit. Well, there's something called a Hohmann transfer. In 1925, Walter Hohmann uh, 
discovered that the most efficient way to boost from a lower orbit to an upper orbit was to uh, you know, convert the circular orbit to an elliptical orbit, then convert that elliptical orbit back to a circular orbit. So um, at perigee, the closest approach to the Earth, the rocket would fire its, the satellite would fire its, its rockets that would uh, reshape the orbit from this green circle to this yellow ellipse. And when it finally reached out to its desired orbit, where it wanted to circularize that orbit, it fired its rockets again. And again, this Hohmann transfer is used for a number of things. It can take you from low Earth orbit to geostationary orbit. This technique can take you from, let's say, you're, or you're at Earth and you want to go to Mars. Well, how do you get there most efficiently? Um, starting from Earth, you'd fire your rockets, you'd make your way out to the orbit of Mars, then fire them again to catch up with Mars and circularize your orbit with respect to Mars. When we go to the moon, same thing, okay? We start from low Earth orbit, make the orbit elliptical until we go out to the moon, okay? Then circularize the orbit to get caught by the moon. And again, um, here's how, you know, we would uh, travel to Mars, for instance, um, to get something to Mars via this home and transfer requires the planets to be in the proper uh, position. So uh, when we launch, if the Earth is here, Mars has to be right about here. And what that means is that after it launches, this projectile is going to fire its rockets, it's going to enter this elliptical orbit and play catch up with Mars. Okay. It is traveling with an orbit with slightly smaller radius, so it's going to be moving faster than Mars. And then ironically, it'll fire its rockets to match Mars's orbit, which will slow it down and, and get it captured there. Remember, it's kind of backwards here that um, as we make the orbit bigger, we actually slow down, even though it involves more energy. And this is one of the reasons why um, a human mission to, to Mars is going to be uh, so difficult. Not only are we going to have to, you know, boost the rockets with enough uh, energy to reach the the orbit of of, of Mars. Mars has more uh, total energy in its orbit than uh, Earth does for for its mass per mass per kilogram. Um, <clears throat> this elliptical orbit to match Mars's orbit is not direct. It is going to take a few months to get out there. Um, and therefore, astronauts during the trip will be exposed to radiation. Uh, they're going to have food needs. They're going to have water needs. Um, it's going to be a substantial uh, trip, uh, much harder than uh, the trip that we took to the moon. And again, um, here's the uh, trip that uh, Mars Global Surveyor took. It was launched in um, 1996. So, you know, a human mission would be very, very similar to this. Uh, launched in, in November 5th, 1996, and it didn't arrive until September of the following year. So, you know, a significant amount of time spent in space, not quite a year, but um, during this journey, obviously, um, the astronauts are exposed to a lot of radiation. And uh, you can't go on a diet for a year where you don't eat any food. You need to either bring all your food along or you need to grow the food while it's going there. We've become very good at recycling water. Um, I'll let your imagination figure that one out. But uh, uh, you know, growing food is still a technology that uh, we're working on today. Okay, so again, that those are Kepler's laws. Once again, um, all planets orbit in elliptical orbits. Of course, we can we can extend this out to any orbiting body. All orbital bodies in a closed orbit will go around their the body that they orbit in an elliptical orbit. Uh, number two, they will sweep out an equal amount of area over time. We saw that that was conservation of angular momentum. Okay, and that implies that as you get closer, you know, perihelion or perigee, you go faster as you go further. The the satellite slows down. And then the third law is that the period of the orbit squared 
is proportional to the radius of the orbit cubed, or more precisely, the semi-major axis cubed.